Good morning. morning. And welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online. We're so thankful that you could join us in worship today. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to any guests that we have. If you are online, welcome. We would love for you to drop a comment in the comment section and let us know that you're joining us today. And if you're here in worship, we would love to meet you outside on the front lawn after worship today. With regard to announcements this week, we would like to thank Dr. Larry Hovis and his wife Kim for being with us today. Larry is the Executive Director at CBF of North Carolina, and so we're delighted that you're here to share the good news with us. The Baptist men are making preparations for their annual fishing trip to Moorhead City. That is October the 21st through the 24th, so if you are interested in participating in this retreat, you can call Lance at the church office to sign up by August the 1st. The labyrinth is still in need of keepers who can come out and make sure that that area is tidy and neat by doing some yard maintenance. And so there are several months on the calendar that are still available for volunteers. And so if you are interested in that and and you're skilled in, in gardening or you just really appreciate the labyrinth, then you can call or email Lance at the church office and um, we would love to sign you up to provide some care for our labyrinth. We do have a church conference coming up at 945 on Sunday, August the 1st. And following that conference, there will be a deacon election held during worship. You should have received a resource guide via email last week. And if you would like a print copy, those resource guides are available today in the glass foyer at the side entrance if you did not get one via email last week. And finally, 12 students, Lance, Annette, and I are going to pack up and leave for passport tomorrow. We're going to Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, so we would appreciate your prayers as um, we're gone next week. We extend the peace of Christ to you and your family. Welcome to worship. Please pray with me. Dear God, come into our midst and have fellowship with us. Make your blessings abundant and grace us with your presence here and beyond our church walls. From the time we sit down in the pew to the time we walk out the door, let us emerge ourselves in your grace and love. And let it unite us in our faith as we do your works. Amen.
please join me in our responsive reading. We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually alive, alive, correct. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words will abide in us. We gather for worship now to the glory of one God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. May we grow wildly as God tends us. Please stand now if you're able and join us in singing hymn 476, Be Strong in the Lord.
Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church family. I'm joining you today from the Marine Corps Air Station at Miramar in San Diego. I want to thank you for the opportunity to serve in this capacity and for your willingness to share me with the Navy Chaplain Corps. This morning, I'm excited to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Larry Hobus. He is no stranger to First Baptist, but I want to make sure that each of you, especially our newcomers, know who he is and what he means to our church. Larry is the executive coordinator of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of North Carolina. He has served in this role since 2004. Our church is a longtime partner of CBF and CBFNC. Larry has pastored four congregations and has degrees from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and NC State University. Thanks to his leadership, CBF of North Carolina is strong, and pastors are truly itching to get to North Carolina. I have found Larry to be both a student of the church and a forward-thinking visionary. He's always out front, but he never leaves any of us behind. I recall my first rural congregation that initially had no affiliation with CBF of North Carolina, yet Larry was very much available to me and more than willing to serve as a mentor, a friend, and a resource. When I felt led to come to First Baptist Elkin, Larry was an encourager and a strong believer in the possibilities for mission and ministry at First Elkin. And then when I got COVID-19 way back in June of 2020, at a time when few people had the virus locally and there were still so many unknowns, I was in quarantine and the phone rang. It was Larry Hobus offering words of encouragement and his heartfelt prayers. You might say that Larry is a pastor's pastor, and I appreciate that. In addition to all the stuff that he does for the CBFNC family, he is also admired by his wonderful, loving wife, Kim, and their daughter, Lauren. Larry, we welcome you to First Baptist Church of Elkin. Our passage of scripture for the morning comes now from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does he prunes, so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in them will bear much fruit. Because without me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. So remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends, because I have told you everything I have heard from my Father. It was not you who chose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. This is my command, that you may love one another. These words are the gift of God. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you, Lance and choir and handbells and Justin and Annette and then Mark up on the video. Wow, we've got uh, a wonderful group leading us in worship today and Kim and I are delighted that we can be with you. Uh, as Mark said, this is not by any means our first visit with you. We've uh, been here a num number of times through the years, but our most recent visit, I was dressed a little differently and I arrived not in my car, but on my bicycle. Uh, last fall, you all were kind enough to welcome me as uh, I was doing our welcome ride for our Welcome House Community Network, which is a, a ministry of CBF of North Carolina to help provide hospitality, housing uh, to vulnerable people. And you were kind enough to host us on the very first annual ride, which uh, was from the mountains to the capital and we did make it to Raleigh finally and then this fall in October we're going to be going from the capital to the coast so uh, you don't have to host us this time Justin but uh, but you can certainly support in other ways and we'll take that uh, yeah thank you so much I'm grateful to your pastor Mark he is a dear friend and uh, I know that uh, you have enjoyed having him here as your pastor and I know I can tell you he loves you as a church family he's always brags on you and talks about how blessed he feels to be your pastor. And so I truly believe that with Mark, you all have a match made in heaven. We do thank you for your partnership with CBF of North Carolina and with our larger CBF family around the country and around the world. Elkin has always been one of our key partner churches, and we're grateful for the ways you have been engaged and involved and supportive through the years and for all those things, we are extremely thankful. And one last little thing I have to say thank you for. Um, we uh, were greeted with, with some bags of vegetables from the church garden when we got here. And my wife, Kim, is so very excited about that. And so we've got to remember, they're in Mark's office. Somebody remind me to get those on the way out, okay? Just thank you so much. I was also pleased this morning to meet Annette. I don't know that we had met before, but I learned that she's one of our CBF interns here and headed off to Divinity School in the fall. And we're praying for you and excited for you as you begin that journey as well. But on to the task at hand, which is to preach the gospel. And my message this morning, Mark read the larger passage of John 15, and I'll be focusing primarily on the first seven verses. But before we begin that, would you join me, please, in a word of prayer? God, for this day and this chance we have to gather with one another in this place, we give you thanks. We thank you for your church, which is your body in the world. We thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for our calling to be your agents of love, mercy, and reconciliation here in this community and throughout the world. And now we pray that you would teach us the truth you would have us to learn this day, that we might not only keep it for ourselves, but share it with the world your son died to save. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Before I ever experienced a call to ministry, I had determined to become an engineer. And I entered NC State University to study in that field. The summer after my freshman year of college, I got a wonderful job serving as an engineering intern. They're all kind of internships but an engineering intern at the Duke Power Company in Charlotte. I, along with several other engineering students, had the responsibility of checking and correcting power line maps. You see, with a map in hand, we would begin at the substation and follow every foot of a line, regardless of how many branches, 
sub-branches and sub-sub-branches that line might take. We often found ourselves going through woods, across creeks, over fences, and through backyards, much to the chagrin of homeowners and their sometimes large and unfriendly dogs. Our purpose was to make corrections to the power line map so that the engineers would then have up-to-date information whenever they would design new service. Well, I learned a lot that summer, including a few things about power. The power which comes into our homes follows a long, circuitous path. It does not originate at the light switch. Even the substation where our mapping work began was not the source of power. In order to truly find the source, we would have to follow the large transmission lines from the substation back to the power plant where the power was originally generated. But you know what? No matter how much power is generated at the power plant, the system is only as strong as the lines transformers, resistors, capacitors, and the like that connect your home or business or school or church to the substation and then back ultimately to the power plant. You see, it's really the connections that make all the difference. Connections are critical. That truth applies not only to electricity and power, but to all organic life. Seeds, roots, sprouts, branches, fruit. The whole cycle of life requires a good connection. Break the connection at any phase of the cycle and the end result will not be growth, but death. That's the context for Jesus' teaching here in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Now, Jesus' disciples did not know a thing about electrical power, but they did know a lot about plants, vines, branches, and fruit. They understood the importance of a good connection. I am the true vine, Jesus says. Besides the fact that people in those days would have been familiar with vines and branches, why else would Jesus compare himself to a vine in order to underscore this truth about the importance of maintaining a good connection? Well, it may be that Jesus and the disciples had recently passed by the front of the temple on which there would have been inlaid a golden vine which was the symbol of Israel. It was a familiar image to the Jews of the first century. Israel was compared to a vine in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and the Psalms. A vine was also inscribed on some of the Jewish coins. Israel saw herself as the vine or the root of God. But just as Jesus already back in the 13th chapter of John had taken the sacred bread and wine of the Passover meal and given them new meaning in himself, Jesus now takes the image of the vine and endows it with new meaning in himself. I am the true vine, Jesus claims. Abide in me. As I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, he says. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the vine or the root of the Lord. Those who believe in him are the branches. <clears throat> and the responsibility of branches is to bear good fruit. The action that will enable this 
fruit bearing to take place is what Jesus calls abiding. Abiding means simply being connected. Being connected to Christ is what gives Christians life and then enables us to bear fruit. If the connection with Christ is broken, if the Christian fails to abide in Christ, then not only will that Christian fail to bear fruit, but he or she will then become useless in the kingdom of God and shall be thrown out as waste. In this passage, Jesus is teaching the disciples and you and me about connections that make a difference. And in this passage, he actually points out three related but vital connections. The first and most obvious connection is the connection with God. Jesus covers this here in the beginning of the passage. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. Abide in me as I abide in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then later, toward the end of the chapter, he says, As the Father has loved me, and I have loved you, abide in my love. Jesus connects us to the Heavenly Father, the source of power, and the energy that runs through that whole process is love. The second connection is between those of us who are connected to Christ. He is the vine, we are the branches, but as branches, we are also connected to one another. Verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. You see, if we're connected to Jesus, the vine, then we are connected to one another through our love for one another. Love, as it's spoken about in the New Testament, is not simply a good feeling. Love is not just an emotion. Love is actually an action. Love requires an act of the will. Love is not emotional, but volitional. It's making a decision to behave in a certain way toward one another, not necessarily to feel in a certain way toward one another. The way we treat one another shows our love for one another. And to break our connection with one another, to fail to love one another, is actually to break our connection to Jesus. The third connection is with the world. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And then he says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Now here in this context, bearing fruit means reproducing ourselves. Bearing fruit means sharing Christ with others so that they can experience his love and mercy and grace. And they can fulfill his purpose for their lives. Unless we connect to others who are not now connected to the Christ vine, then we're actually not fulfilling our mission, our purpose as branches. So what does all this mean for us as we emerge from a global pandemic? These connections with God with one another, our brothers and sisters in the family of God and and the world, these connections are more important, I believe, now than ever before. That is a truth that is rooted in the gospel itself, and it will not change. But the way we make all those connections, you know, they actually might need some adjustment. Many times over the last year and a half, I have so much wanted for life to just get back to normal, haven't you? Haven't you become so tired of all the precautions and all the things we have to worry about 
and all the news and all the disruption. I don't know about you, but I certainly have. I've yearned for life to get back to normal, whatever that means. But let's be honest. Let's just be perfectly honest today with one another. Things weren't actually just totally wonderful before March of 2020. We had our issues in the world, in our nation, in our culture, and even, yes, in the church. In fact, here in the church, we found ourselves, we found that everything seemed to be shifting all around us, and we were reluctant at times to adapt our ministries accordingly. So that meant we often were struggling as the church. Maybe COVID-19 was actually a much-needed wake-up call for us. Maybe somehow or another, through this process, God has been pruning us a little bit the way Jesus describes in this passage. Maybe finally we need to take a hard look at ourselves and how we do things. Maybe find some newer, faithful, and effective ways to, to pursue God's call in our lives. These three basic connections remain, connecting to God, connecting to one another, and connecting to our neighbors, but maybe we can learn some new ways to make those connections. So let me ask you a few questions. First of all, how's your connection with God? What are the practices you are engaging in to maintain and even strengthen that connection? Your own personal spiritual practices, your prayer life, your time <clears throat> with God's word, your time simply being in silence before the Lord. And how about your connections to your church family? What does that look like for you? I see that we're worshiping today as we have been for a long time now, not only in person, but also through the gift of technology. And that's wonderful. And I'm glad we've learned to do that over this period. We can be connected whether we can come to this building or not, but I also want to encourage us all to think about how important it is that we find those connections, whether they are in person or whether they happen to be online. On the one hand, we've learned that in person is not the only way to be connected. On the other hand, we do not want to use the, the convenience of technology as an excuse not to do the hard work of living in face-to-face -face community with one another either. So what are the ways we can gather? What are the ways we can connect? What are the ways we can be together with one another, whether we are together or whether we are scattered? And then finally, of course, there is the connection to the world. I'm a firm believer that unless the church is engaged in mission, unless the church is pointed outward towards its community and towards the world, then ultimately it is not being the church. God did not send his son into the world just for your benefit and my benefit. God sent his son because he loved the world not just the church. How are we engaging with our community? How are we engaging with the world? And toward that end, I'd like to tell you a story about one of your sister churches in another part of the state who's rethinking what that means. A few years back, I received a call from one of Mark's colleagues and one of our pastors in the state. He lived in one of our fellowships, or he served one of our fellowships, many small town First Baptist churches, not unlike this church. It's located in a community that was once dominated in an earlier era by a textile mill. Both the town and the church were built on the textile industry. In the good old days, that First Baptist church was sort of the church for the mill's upper management, plus the professional people in the community, doctors, lawyers, teachers, business owners, and the like. Most of the mill workers actually went to other churches out in the surrounding county. 
but white collar workers of a Baptist bent found themselves at First Baptist. That's just the way it was. Church didn't really have to do a lot to reach out to the community. The community kind of made its way into First Baptist. So we were visiting and I was wanted to find out how this pastor was doing because I knew that that community had been hit really hard. And to be honest, I expected to find him somewhat depressed and discouraged and sort of doom and gloom. Instead, he was very positive and upbeat. He said, let me tell you about what's going on in our church. I've never enjoyed ministry more than I'm enjoying it today. Our church has been studying the Bible and praying and seeking God's direction like never before, and we've determined that we're called to be a church that uses its resources to serve those without resources. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, let me give you some examples. First of all, we're working very closely with the community social ministries organization in our community. They do all kinds of things to minister to the poor. And we used to just send them a tiny little bit of money every year. But now we send them much more money. But more importantly, our folks are very involved in volunteering and provided leadership to this organization that serves our entire county. He said, secondly... We've been actually hosting homeless people in our building. You wouldn't think that a little town like ours would have many homeless people, but we do. And so we started a ministry to let them stay in the church building. And then we feed them while we're here. They're here as well. And at first, to be honest with you, some of our members were kind of skeptical, even critical. They worried that these folks might come in and mess up our building and we might create liability issues with our insurance company and all those kinds of things. But you know, we're not hearing too much of that kind of talk anymore. In fact, one of the fiercest opponents is now in charge of cooking breakfast in the mornings for our guests. He said, we've also adopted the school in our county that had the lowest socioeconomic level of any school in our area. He said, our folks tutor and volunteer and help in classrooms, and they've joined the PTA, even though none of them have any kids in that school. He said, you know, that's one of the biggest problems with poor schools. The parents don't have the time or the money to help that much with the school, so the, the students suffer. And he said, because our church has gotten so involved, it's been empowering to both teachers and their families. Oh, and he said, Larry, there is one more thing, one more thing i got to tell you about, and that's soccer. You see, our church had been sponsoring for many years this Christian soccer league, and we had Christian coaches, and they offered prayer before the game and a devotional at halftime, and we got a lot of different kids from the community. But then we started studying this thing, and we figured out that just about every kid that came to our soccer league had an opportunity to play soccer somewhere else. They were primarily middle-class kids, and they could go to the Y or the community rec league, and we were just giving them another opportunity to play soccer, but with kind of a Christian veneer. So we've completely redone our soccer league. We discovered this underserved community where the kids can't afford to play in one of those other leagues. And so we've, we've reached out to them, and we've invited them to come and play in our soccer league for free. Because we figure that whenever, when Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you're serving me, well, we figure that applies to soccer too. Then he described all these many ministries that First Baptist is involved in, much of which actually takes place outside the walls of the church. And he talked about how their focus had shifted from inward to outward, from their problems with money and status and church programs and a loss of status in the community to the ministry opportunities that were all around them. And he concluded, he said, you know, Larry, I think we're finally becoming the church. We were always meant to be. That church is making connections that make a difference. Dr. Paige Kelly, now deceased, taught Old Testament at Southern Seminary in Louisville and then the Baptist Theological Seminary at Richmond. And he told the story of a Native American man who lived on a reservation outside of Juneau, Alaska. This was many years ago, long before there was widespread use of electricity in that area. 
this gentleman had never ever seen an electric light and he said that so after the power lines reached Juno he came to town to purchase some supplies as you can imagine he was quite surprised when the shop owner reached over to the wall flipped a switch and the light came on the man asked the merchant if he could purchase one of those lights and so the merchant ran off about three feet of electrical cord screwed a socket on the end screwed a bulb in gave him all that equipment the man returned home, hung the cord from his ceiling, and waited for darkness to fall. Then he gathered together his family. He reached up, pulled the switch, but nothing happened. He was so disappointed. He had in his possession everything he could see in the store. Everything that was needed for light. Everything that is, except for one thing, his cord was not connected to the source of power. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me as I abide in you. Go and bear fruit, fruit that will Brothers and sisters of First Baptist Church of Elk, and now more than ever, it is vital that you maintain a good connection first with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and then with one another, your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and then relying on that power, connect with this community and with our world. Make connections that make a difference. For only then can you bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And then you will become the church that you were always meant to be. Please pray with me. We thank you, God, for, for loving us so much that you want to be in relationship with us. We thank you for connecting with us in ways we don't understand and don't deserve. Help us to make the most of that connection and in turn show us in our time how we might make connections that make a difference so that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How is your connection with God? What is your connection with our community at large. As we stand to sing our closing hymn today, I encourage you to wrestle with that question, and I will be down front to receive you if maybe you need to connect with God in prayer, or if you need to connect with God by connecting with our community of faith here at First Baptist Church, I will be down front to receive you. Please join me in our hymn of response, hymn 557, People Need the Lord.
Thank you so much for being with us in worship today. At this time, I will ask our ushers to come forward. Please remain in your pew until the ushers release you. Um, and we also have our offering plates at each station. So if you are prepared to give this morning, you can drop your offering in the offering plate. We also um, have a giving option online. You can go to elkinfbc.com. And you can click on the Give tab and give that way. Or you can mail in your offering to 110 Gwynn Avenue. And um, we so appreciate your gifts as they help us fulfill the mission and the ministry at First Baptist Church of Elkin. Let's bow our heads together for the benediction. As we leave this place today, keep Christ's commands and abide in his love. Go forth in peace and justice. Go forth to love and serve. Share in Christ's mission and bear fruit that will last. Go forth rejoicing as witnesses in our community and our world. Amen. Thank you.